First, on the topic of diversity and inclusion, I'd like to introduce Stephen Kekis. Steve is the Vice President and Charlotte, Charlotte Region Leader for Messer Construction. Messer Construction is a company that's committed to diversity and, and inclusion in their own business and in the community. Steve is an active sponsor and mentor as well as Board of Advisors member for the Charlotte Minority Economic Development Initiative, which we'll hear more about. Uh, thank you, Steve, for joining us today. <coughs> Thank you, everybody, and welcome to Charlotte. Uh, it truly is an honor today to be standing here in front of you talking about diversity and inclusion and how we're doing it in the Charlotte region. Um, it truly is a core value of Messer. It's one of those principles we started over 20 years ago with Messer Construction and defined this is one of the things that's going to make us successful and make the communities in which we live the places we want to be. And we've been driving it ever since. As I thought about the speakers today, and I'm sure there are diversity officers here in the region and here in the room, I thought about well, they would probably be better than I. They live this and breathe this every day around diversity and what it means. And then I started truly thinking about what it means to me. And as an operations vice president, this is where the rubber meets the road here. People talk about inclusion and diversity being the right thing being the smart thing to do, I'm here to tell you that that's your bottom line. It truly does make a difference. And it makes a difference in the communities that we all live in every day. It's where we want to live. The world is changing, and I'm sure your world is changing in Lexington and Louisville as well. The graph up on the screen represents the population growth here in the Shark region over the last 10 years. And you'll see that our Latino and Asian and African American population has exploded. It's because this is where people want to live, because we're progressive and where we're going. So we as business owners, what do we want? We want educated workforces. We want um, job creation, strength, strength in our supply chain. And again, we want to grow our families where it's fun and to work, live and play. I understand last night you had a reception at the Mint Museum. I understand today you're doing a scavenger hunt and you're going to the NASCAR Hall of Fame. I was talking to somebody and they were down at Max Speed Shop tasting some of our barbecue here in the South. So all of these kinds of things are what diversity and inclusion in growing cities represent. These build communities. It requires vision. It requires strength, and I'm telling you that you got to challenge yourself to change. It's not doing it the way status quo was. You definitely have to challenge yourself to change. Three years ago, I had the privilege of joining CMEX, the Charlotte Minority Economic Development Initiative. It's a joint venture between the Chamber, the Charlotte Chamber of Commerce, and CMSDC, the Carolina Supplier Minority Diversity Council, came together and started this. It's about intentionally accelerating the growth of small business and minority businesses in the Charlotte region to continue to attract them. It started out as a very small group, and today there's more than 17 majority partners and investors involved in CMED. Many of the names you'll recognize, and some of them, if you haven't, you'll get to meet them throughout this week as well. And it has continued to grow. We focus on important strategic priorities and opportunities, things like accelerating the growth, building a robust, diverse supplier chain, creating MBEs, and trading jobs, because that's really the bottom line. If you're really going to invest time in acceleration, it's about trading that time. I'm going to back up for one second, all the way to here, because I love our tagline. And our tagline is participate, engage, grow. Action items. This organization is about taking action and making a difference. Okay. 
So how does it work? And I've got up on the screen some of our metrics and challenges in our growth over time. You can see that when we started in 2011, we did about $500,000 worth of contract value. Today we're over $40 million within the CMEDI program that we're attracting. But what's important to me on this slide is the metrics themselves. You've got to track things that matter. You've got to track connections and RFQs and how many of those types of things that the people within the organization are about. I talked about the 17 majority contractors. There's 19 MBEs and small businesses within this organization as well. And the way it works is every month, for about 18 months, every month we get together formally and we talk about capacity building. We put on programs within our organization that can help the suppliers and contractors grow within the CMEDI program. We put on pitch sessions where the suppliers come in to Bell or to one of the other organizations and give their pitch to a captive audience of suppliers so that they have that one-on-one -on -one interface and we work with them so that they can have that knowledge and how to best prepare that. We work with them with board development because this is about succession. It's not just about getting the great numbers, but it's about building a community and building companies. So we work within a succession plan with marketing and with branding as well. But to me, most importantly, you heard me talk about those 18 meetings that one of our sessions will go. It's about that interaction. It's about that networking opportunity that every one of those suppliers and contractors has with a true decision maker from one of the major majority companies here in Charlotte. Every month, they have that interface. They can ask good questions. They get to know people with a much greater depth. And that's why we're driving these kind of numbers, is because it truly does make a difference. I'm going to talk a little bit about one of our um, companies, Metro Transportation. And Kimball, who is now the COO, when I first met him three and a half years ago, he was just coming out of the warehouse. He worked in a warehouse. And Mr. Green, the operator, gave him more and more responsibility. Today, he's now the COO. They're working in, in succession planning. And he's tripled the company's income, revenue, and full-time employees here in Charlotte. So those are the kind of things that really do make a difference. And I can tell you, I don't think there's a company that we started with that isn't still part of it in some capacity today. So it's not like people are trying it out and then failing out. They're really truly there working on it. So our next steps, we're in phase two, getting ready to go into phase three of the CMEDI program. And our next step is to gain more MBEs that want to be in it. So we're going through a screening process. We just don't let everybody in. There's certain criteria that we've got to have because this is about acceleration. This is about having a business model that we can help create, grow, and move forward as fast as we can go. We have an alumni. We're rolling out an alumni section because people have been in it for two or three years now. And we have an alumni section. The people that are our cheerleaders, actually, that will be out there cheering for us and still staying engaged. And we're working on sustainability. Sustainability being both economically sustainable, because everybody today has been tapped out on funds. So how do we make it still remain economically sustainable and also our structure so that it works well for us? Those are the things we're working on today. But in the end, truly, it's your community. In Lexington and in Louisville, it's your community that you're trying to grow. You know, every one of us has one of these. There's no app for diversity and inclusion. There's no magic button you can push. It takes hard work, it takes vision, it takes willingness to change. So I would challenge you today, is it really something you want to get into? And are you really willing to put the work to it? And if you are, there's three or four models, ours being one of them, that can truly help you succeed. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Next, I would like to invite Deborah Campbell to the stage to talk about transportation and land use integration. 
Deborah is the planning director for the city of Charlotte. One of our areas of focus for this trip is quality in place. Deborah's mission is to develop and implement public policy that makes this community a livable, economically vibrant, and memorable urban center. We look forward to hearing ideas that we can bring back to Lexington and Louisville that will further enhance our quality of place. Thank you and good morning. Uh, I hope that you are uh, enjoying our city and spending lots of money. Uh, and if you haven't started spending before now, start spending. We, 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 need, your, we need your dollars. Um, I, I also um, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about something that's really near and dear to my heart, particularly being uh, an urban planner, is about how to integrate uh, land use planning and transportation planning. Oh, I also want to say welcome to Charlotte. And underneath you see a quote that is one of my favorite quotes as it relates to, to planning. A city is not an accident, but the result of coherent visions and aims. When I think about Charlotte, and I think about what we're trying to do in our community, I think that we are really a great city, aspiring to be greater. And so some of the features and characteristics of great cities are they are a city of three great places, and hopefully you'll see a number of those as you traverse and, and travel our community. Uh, you've already heard talk about the types of employment opportunities that we have in our community. A city with um, great jobs. A city that treasures and celebrates its resources, meaning that we want to be um, a sustainable city, so we embrace all of the natural uh, resources that um, we have. A city of great neighborhoods. We want to be a community that actually provides a range of housing opportunities for people with a range of incomes. Uh, we want to also be a city that responds to um, market conditions and creates and enhances market opportunities. And an infrastructure investment really can do that. It can create economic development opportunities. Uh, a city that serves a growing and diverse population. You heard already about the growing um, Hispanic and minority population that we have uh, in our community. A city that is engaged, that is that we intentionally go out and invite our citizens in order to participate in any type of policy development process that we get into. So communities that really can compete as it relates to the 21st century have a whole lot of things going on. But what we think in Charlotte is going to distinguish us, particularly from other southern communities, is our ability to provide mobility choices, transportation options that are integrated with and support a land use strategy. And so when we think about our community, and, and actually it's not thinking, it is reality, it's what's happening uh, to Charlotte. In terms of the people that are coming from outside of the community to our community, because we are an employment hub, we've got um, 153,000 people commuting in, only 40,000 commuting out, which essentially means that one in three people live outside of our community. Charlotte will continue to grow. We know that. Uh, we probably you can see from the graph, we are not growing at the rate that we were growing in our go-go years, uh, which were in the 80s and 90s, but there has been really a steady amount of growth. And the people who are coming here, they're not bringing their infrastructure with, with them from the community that they came from. So we've got to figure out a way of how do we then uh, accommodate um, that work. So uh, we are expected to add about 500,000 more people in the next uh, 30 years to our community. So it's not if we grow, it's how we grow. And land use, integration, transportation really addresses, uh, addresses how we grow. So, what we have done in Charlotte, and this um, strategy came about in the early 1990s, which we call centers, quarters, and wedges. That is, we are looking at um, major uh, 
uh, infrastructure, particularly highways, the potential for rail and major thoroughfares, and we are organizing a development pattern around that major infrastructure. We're trying to literally take advantage of our historical development pattern and then be more strategic and intentional in terms of how we invest and improve uh, in that uh, uh, infrastructure that currently exists. We're recommending and encouraging through this Center Sports and Wages uh, framework, reuse and redevelopment rather than going into um, our green fields. And again, this was uh, adopted uh, in the um, early 1990s and then updated in 2010. And so what does that strategy look like on the ground? The purple areas are pink areas depending upon um, your, your color team. Uh, are the corridors and our uh, transit program is organized around those uh, five major transportation corridors. Within that corridor, there's the opportunity for rail, there's a major highway, and then there's several major thoroughfares, as I said. The darker and lighter areas in um, blue are what we call our centers. They're major, generally, employment centers where we want to encourage higher density development both in our centers as well as in our corners. The area around it that is um, green is the wedges where we will generally have lower density development. So essentially, again, this is a marriage between here is the development vision that we have and here is the mobility opportunities that we need to invest in in order for us to achieve that vision. We also have adopted, well, at least I should say we, our elected officials, have adopted a transportation action plan. And the bullet that you see is the transportation action plan supports the center supporters and wedges. It's not just about mobility. It's about what kind of community do you want to become and how do you invest in the infrastructure in order for you to achieve and realize it. It's also not about how many streets we build. It's also about what is the design of those streets. Are they complete and do they address the needs, the mobility needs, of a range of users, which would be uh, cyclists, which would be pedestrians uh, and the like, and obviously models. And so we want fewer streets that look like this and more streets that look like this are better. In addition to kind of the um, typical type of transportation planning, which are mostly roadways, highways, um, we also have invested a lot of thinking into um, transit, that is rapid transit. Uh, one of the things that um, was really the biggest obstacle when we developed our 2005 plan, which happened in 1985, was that we were promoting transit in the 1980s, and the development pattern of Charlotte was very strong and very low density, and people were saying, why are you doing this? You're trying to force us into a lifestyle, and, it's, and what this is about, this is about choices. This is about lifestyle choices in terms of if you want to live in higher density, like in a center or quarter, you have that opportunity as well as link with transportation options. If you want to live in the wedges, little lower density, you have that option as well. So our transit strategy, again, came about not separate from a roads strategy. They were combined. You need both. When you get off the train, in some instances, in order to get to the train, or the bus, rapid transit, if we were to have it. You need a street to get there. And so we could not uh, disconnect those. So we put it to the voters. The voters um, identified a half cent sales tax that was levied. As you can see, uh, it was approved um, by 58 to 42% and then reaffirmed uh, in 2007, which was the year that our actual uh, first line opened in 2007. Um, so we have strategies, again, linked to those five corridors that I identified, with the addition being um, the Center City corridor, which is a, a streetcar line. And uh, perhaps if you've walked around our community, you've seen a whole lot of construction on a major thoroughfare that runs through our city, our major street. And that is for our streetcar development. 
Um, the one that is actually functioning now, which we call um, our blue line, and then we have a blue line extension that goes further um, north and northeast, uh, is under construction, and you can see kind of the uh, characteristics of that line, and I won't go into the details. Uh, we are starting our new uh, extension of that line, uh, and you can see generally uh, we're going to be open for and receiving fares by 2017 uh, for the extension. And then this is the description of our of our streetcar um, project that's underway. Essentially, we have constructed and under construction to here in our first phase, and this will be our second phase. So we'll have that much completed, we hope, um, by 2017. So when you think about, and I'm trying to kind of summarize this uh, and wrap this up, our land use and transportation integration starts with the vision of who we want to be from a development pattern perspective. And then how do we, again, invest in the appropriate infrastructure to support that vision? And so if we take here, our growth framework, and then it permeates through all of the kinds of uh, transportation and mobility policies um, that we develop, even down to an area plan, which is a real specific, parcel specific recommendation about what type of land use um, should be appropriate for, for an area. Within those plans are also specific types of streets, specific types of street design that should accommodate that development um, pattern. And so essentially, in kind of language terms, what are we trying to achieve? We want our community to be walkable, connected. We want to have a uh, mixture of uses and diversity. We want mixed housing, quality architecture, increased density, smart transportation. You can see a number of, again, the kind of land use, qualitative type things, but also the infrastructure that supports that development pattern. So in conclusion, uh, implementation of our, sorry about that, of our growth and development framework, centers, corridors, and wedges is key, and it's the focus and goal of our transportation strategy. We've adopted a multi-modal complete street approach to transportation and street design. However, the pedestrian trip is our highest priority. Maintaining mobile choices promotes and supports um, economic development and regional competitiveness and regional collaboration, critical but often difficult. What I didn't talk about um, through the slide presentations is the work that we're doing with our airport, uh, which is obviously a, a transportation type infrastructure and development around it and the appropriateness of certain types of land uses, as well as a freight mobility study that we're doing from a regional um, perspective. Uh, and obviously we have the type of planning organizations, the metropolitan planning organization, actually my department from the planning department perspective supports that effort and I have three staff assigned to, um, to implement uh, that, that program. Um, but that will conclude um, my remarks and I think we are now ready for that. Finally, to talk about Charlotte's downtown, or as they refer to it, uptown development, we welcome David Furman to the stage. David is an architect and developer who specializes in unique residential and mixed-use developments. David's company, Centro City Works, has designed and developed 18 projects in downtown Charlotte and the South End. He is currently on the board of Charlotte Center City Partners, working to facilitate and promote the economic, cultural, and residential development of the urban core. David, welcome to the stage. After David uh, concludes, we'll open it up to uh, questions for the panel. Well, thanks. Uh, welcome, Sean. Looks like a few people might be playing hooky, mm -hmm. drifting out in a beautiful day, enjoying our city. I'm going to uh, zero in more on housing and development of housing downtown because that's what I do, that's what I know. And, uh, but it goes hand in hand, I think, with the overall uh, downtown. I think what differentiates cities from being fun, viable places to be in the cities that we all remember being is whether people live there or whether it's just an office park that empties out at times park. And uh, we have managed to get a jump start on that. And, and the jump start um, 
I think is because we got to experience this wonderful battle of the banks. I don't know if you've heard about what happened over the last 20 years before 2008. Uh, during those 20 years, I spent a lot of time bragging about how we were the number two financial center in America behind New York City. And then in 2008, it was like, oh crap, <laughs> number two financial center behind New York City. Uh, and we uh, really felt that uh, when Wachovia rolled off the table in 2008. But I'm going to walk you through that. I think Charlotte does have his mojo back and there's a pulse on the street these days. But I'm going to walk through a bit of the history of, as it pertains to residential and how we got to where we are today. This is a picture of my mom strutting her stuff down Tryon Street circa the 1930s. When all, she lived a few blocks from her job, all cities were were vibrant then, we were full of people working. It was the living room of our community and people lived, worked, and played there, et cetera. And then we all know what happened after that. And it was a, a flight from the suburbs where we all were chasing the American dream of having our own single family house. And uh, today that's created a bit of isolation. I think there is a real thirst for community that's come back that we all know about. The first really uh, uh, rejuvenation that happened downtown was in Fourth Ward, and this was in the late 70s, early 80s. There was a quadrant of the city that had these wonderful old homes in it. They were dilapidated. There was a movement, I think, initiated by the Junior League. Uh, but uh, they talked to banks into pooling a bunch of low interest money. So if you would live in Fourth Ward and rejuvenate these houses, re renovate these houses, you had access to these low interest mortgages. It was very successful. They brought in development, there were condo developments, townhouse developments that also had access to this low interest mortgage pool. Uh, but it didn't really last. Uh, after it was over, about the mid 80s, nothing really happened as far as more housing coming into Charlotte until about the mid 90s. Uh, by this point, retail had totally left downtown in, in, in major streams. My mom was going to one of these retail stores to work. Uh, this used to be Ivy's. And one of our uh, local developers who was very uh, innovative and entrepreneurial, took this building and gutted it and turned it into a condo building. And nobody had seen anything like that in that day. And it was, uh, the guy who really took notice of it though was Hugh McCall. And Hugh McCall was on his way to trying to build the biggest bank in America, uh, biggest bank in the world, and he wanted the headquarters to be here. And he understood the concept that if my headquarters are gonna be in Charlotte, North Carolina, I've got to be able to attract the brightest talent there is to this city. If I'm gonna do that, I've gotta make this city a place where these young folks wanna live. So, and uh, the towers started to spring up downtown. North Trine Street was not that great of area at the time. He started moving down North Trine, acquiring property, and started doing the scale of buildings that were more like a DC scale to get away from the high rises. Uh, this building uh, he acquired this whole block, there's a giant garage underneath this block, and he built an office building on the front, but he insisted that the back half, where it touches Fourth Ward, be residential building. And, uh, that was quite quite a movement. I remember uh, going with on the jet to California to talk Transamerica into taking this office building. And they were no, we don't want the residential there. And the Bank of America guys packed up their bags and said that the residential is going to be there. We're going to have that. And so this project was built. It, it set the tone that downtown was going to be a great place to live. And uh, the movement had started. The next block down, Bank of America built another office building on the corner, another residential building in the back. These buildings are all built, and downtown Charlotte is so compact, I invite you to get out and walk these streets and see these things. And walk through Fourth Ward, it's an incredible little neighborhood. Uh, apartment, uh, post apartments, uh, you know, in the, the mid 80s, mid 90s, became interested in urbanism, came to Charlotte, and started building apartments. Uh, this was one that was down on Grand Street. It was one of the first concepts where the, the parking garage was buried in the middle and it was surrounded by apartments. And we've all seen a lot of those these days. On two different fronts, it, it was more uh, up on Grand Street where it was a busy industrial street. It looked like that. Back on the other side where it dipped into Fourth Ward, it took on a, a more of a residential scale look. Um, and more apartments followed. Bank of America wanted to build a million square foot call center. And rather than taking that to the suburbs, which would have been a lot easier and cheaper, uh, they acquired all of these blocks in Third Ward downtown. Again, another neighborhood that needed some revitalization. They did a master plan, conscientiously detached what was then the largest parking garage in North Carolina 
from their million square feet of office. So it would force development around that garage. It would force people that were going to that garage to get out of their car, go to the street, walk the street a block to go to the go to their uh, place of work, rather than integrating it all into one cohesive building. So here's the, how it evolved. Here's the Bank of America building. Here's that giant Whopper garage. And then these became housing sites all around. So you could build a neighborhood at the base of which was this wonderful corporate center. Uh, our company got involved building condos around there that were all mixed use. There was retail all along, the, all along the streets, condos above, post came in, apartments, wonderful little courtyards inside the block. Again, a mixed use, retail along the streets. So if you go down to this area now, it, it's, a, it's one of the, the greatest urban blocks in downtown Charlotte, I think. This is the site that was a, the edge of this parking garage. This is a 30 feet by 300 foot site that our Centro company acquired and we thought, well, let's build some cool condos there. So we veneered the garage, retail on the ground floor. These units were a little two-story units that were about 14 feet wide, had brick walls in them, a little steel stair, went up to a mezzanine. Uh, we set up a kiosk down at Founders Hall and with boards of this and an announcement, and we sold it, the whole thing out in like 48 hours. Those were the days. <laughs> and the young guys were running to ATM machines getting cash to, for deposits, and I went home and cash. I'm not going to love their pockets full of cash, but man, this, this development business is going to pan out. Uh, but again, you. He calls up in this tower, he looks down at this quadrant of the city, First Ward, which had, had become a ghetto. I mean, what we've learned in America is when you concentrate poor people in one place, there's a concentration of hopelessness, and that breeds a concentration of problems. So there was a giant public housing project here. Of course, skipping before that, this was a wonderful quadrant of the city. Then there was this, this American phenomenon called urban renewal uh, that wiped all of that out. It ended up being a public housing project that turned the neighborhood into a really a not a good place to be. Uh, the housing authority was, got a hook six grant to work on their blocks. But Bank of America thought, well, you know, we can expand that and leverage it into this whole quadrant of the city. They started acquiring property. They put together a partnership with Bank of America's Community Development, the Housing Authority, and the city of Charlotte to enhance the infrastructure. Uh, got a, a, a nationally recognized master planner to create a plan which revitalized housing, built new housing, added new sites for, for new projects, uh, took these existing buildings, some of which were renovated into these, built new ones. This is all, uh, this is all public housing, 60% uh, market rate, 40% subsidized. Might be the opposite. But it's anyway, it's, it's about half and half market rate and subsidized. Bank of America Community Development built affordable housing in this neighborhood. Our, our company, which is one of the, the few development entities that really believed this could be a wonderful urban neighborhood, started buying up properties and developing different types of products, you know, unique townhouses, lofts, roof terraces, um, three-story townhouses where you lived on the second floor. Funky little townhouses with small units on the top, driving affordability. And that neighborhood today, again, it's, it's, there's a dozen projects that we did down there, but it's just a wonderful, wonderful neighborhood uh, that has been totally transformed through the leverage of the Hope Six Grant. And it's totally integrated, it's totally uh, integrated economic levels as, as well as racial. Uh, Wachovia finally got in the game. And uh, on the other end of uh, Trying Street, built this wonderful project on top of a parking garage they needed for this building. Uh, with some uh, mixed use and retail on the ground floor. There's one, this incredible park. I, I hope you guys get a chance to see this. If you walk across the street, you walk right through this park over to our museum complex. And housing was really taking off downtown at this point. This is a small scale project we were going to do at First Ward. And then there was an announcement that the arena was going to be built, and that was our site. So we went, well, we need to up the ante here. So we turned it into this building, put it out there in the marketplace, and the, we couldn't handle the response, it was so overwhelming. So we quickly pulled it back and grew it some more into this <laughs> building. And uh, it ended up being this, which is built over there now behind the arena. 
Uh, that led to more high rises. There was really more stuff happening this time. This was sort of the height of the go-go years. And we did this building, which is total mixed use, uh, retail ground floor, this box here is offices on the lower seven floors and then housing above that. And uh, with this project, we sort of uh, limboed in as the curtain was falling <laughs> and managed to get under the wire. At the same time, this building was an office building. It had sort of drifted into a class B office building that uh, our, one of our local developers totally reskinned it and turned it into this condo project. And then uh, as things were progressing, these buildings got built. Novair, you might have heard that name, came to town, built this condo building. Uh, they built this one, which uh, was finished after 2008 and turned into apartments. And you see the date down here, sort of the end of seven, when we still had a lot of cranes in the air. Uh, but it was shortly after that, that the, uh, this was all going to stop. This building stopped and remained a shell just like this for about five or six years. It's now just been completed as a, uh, as a hotel with condos on the top. There's a great restaurant on the top called Fahrenheit. I invite you to go check that out. Uh, this is, these are buildings that didn't get done during this era, which is kind of amazing. We were, there was so much momentum. This was a combination of hotel and condos that we were doing next to the arena. Uh, this building was on top of the epicenter. This building was on top of this garage right out here behind us, behind the Weston. <coughs> this building was on Trine Street. All these were proposed and did not get done. Uh, that was on top of the Mint Museum. Amazing all these things were all being proposed simultaneously. This building did get built, so there is a there is a 50-story residential building you'll see as you uh, over towards Fourth Ward. It is now apartments. It was condos at the time. It's been very successful as we morphed from the condo world into this rental world. There's still the same demand for people that want to live downtown. They just want to pay for it differently. Um, and as the curtain came down, we did have these great projects that were under construction, and these were being built and completed during the recession. NASCAR Hall of Fame, uh, the Gantt Center, uh, the Museum for African American Culture right across the street. Incredible, incredible complex of buildings. I hope you have a chance to walk around and explore. This is the Mint Museum, the Becker Museum, which houses a private art collection, a new night theater back here, which is in between our bigger performing arts center and our smaller venues. And then what was to be the Wachovia World Headquarters is now the Duke Energy World Headquarters. But it was built, all of these things were built, and we're so fortunate that these projects all were started and underway. We, we couldn't back up when 2008 happened because now coming out of that, they're here and they're, they're incredible projects. We also built this, this terrific Romero Bearden Park, which is a, a, a few blocks west of here, I invite you to explore, uh, which opened about a year ago, right in the heart of downtown. It's going to be our, it's our little mini living room in the center of the city. And then our minor league baseball stadium just opened in April. But these projects have already started to spur new development. These are apartments going up behind baseball. That will, that's behind the uh, baseball stage. It's just getting started. This project is uh, well, it, it'll probably finish in the next few months right on Romero Beard Park. These are all rentals. This is a, in the left field of baseball. Uh, this is a new project that has just broken ground down 10th Street. It'll be the next, it'll be the, the next high rise that will be underway. Now there, it was in the condo business, and now in the apartment business. And, and then we have a couple of new office buildings. Here. This building is just not only uh, announced, but announced they have tenants and they're moving forward. And it's, this is on Pine Street. This will be a new hotel building that will be back on the Premier Beard Park. So all this is underway. And then right across the street, the Crescent Resources is proposing this complex, which will be incredible. Um, I think that's all I have. But this, it's definitely a, uh, there's definitely a pulse on the street now that we haven't felt in the last few years. And, I, and it's, it's very exciting to me to be a part of that, to be a part of the history of all that. And it wouldn't have happened if that battle hadn't happened 20 years ago that's given us a jump start on as we come back out of the, the recession and look towards the future. And I think we're poised for that. So, thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Steve, Deborah, and Dave, for sharing your insights on these relevant and timely topics. Uh, we'd like to take a few questions. Uh, we have the open mic set up there and uh, take advantage of this uh, all-star team we have up in front of you here. Um, to get us started, I'd like to ask Deborah if Charlotte has any current infrastructure limitations uh, that could be holding back current or future growth, things like sanitary and storm sewer capacity issues, supply of available commercial industrial land, that sort of thing. That's a, that's a tough question, uh, but I will suggest to you that when we adopt the council adopted the transportation action plan, which uh, addresses a lot of our um, major thoroughfares and highways, uh, we found that we had such a significant shortfall of our ability to fund <coughs> all of the uh, street and infrastructure needs that we have, as well as transit. Uh, our only source of revenue for funding transit from a local perspective is a tax and sales tax. We have to go to the legislature uh, if we want to increase that. Um, this is not the time to go to our legislature to ask for an increase in taxes. In <laughs> so I would suggest to you that a lot of the um, roads, streets, and, and transportation are, are the most of our capital um, issues and, and the gap between our ability uh, to fund certainly what we need and definitely what we want. Thank you. Uh, Herb Miller from Lexington. I, I'm one of those people who fly in and out of your airport, really don't spend much time in your city. It's a great opportunity. And I looked out my motel window this morning and saw an airport or imagined an airport that was built on was once farmland. A, uh, a lot of hotels and buildings, office buildings that were once uh, once historic or at least old buildings stood. I thought about populations being displaced from development and I wonder if you could reflect back on the times when those decisions were being made. What were the deliberate conversations that occurred? How did you resolve the, uh, the issues of dissent and how did you move forward? And I'll hang up and listen to your answer. <laughs> Um, uh, very, very uh, good question, and it, it, um, it really speaks to the values and the, um, the heart of our, of our community. I, I would suggest to you that in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, driven by, unfortunately, uh, some federal policies, federal highway administration policies, uh, the mortgage industry policies, um, we did, we and many other communities across this country uh, made some decisions because money was uh, and it literally was an opportunity for us to remove blight and do it very quickly. And you're right, one of the consequences of that um, was uh, displacement and um, the destruction of not only buildings and structures, uh, but a sense of community. We learned a lot from the period of urban renewal and the displacement process that we uh, went through. We now, and our elected officials, like to think about the development process that we go through now as responsible development. And so there is always emphasis um, placed on what is this development proposal, who does it impact, how does it mitigate the impact, and what are the additional sources of revenue, or uh, linkages, or connections that we need to make in order uh, to do this in a more sensitive manner. I'll give you an example uh, of our development along the light rail line. Uh, we know how uh, this just almost destructive some public projects can be. Literally, sometimes in the beginning, um, we're removing people, we're displacing people. While you're under construction, you don't have access to businesses. We have done um, what I think is extremely innovative in terms of having lots of, and I have to put one of the values of a great city, characteristics of a great city is engagement. 
And so we have engaged all of those property owners along that line, uh, all the businesses. Uh, we've done extraordinary things in terms of signage. We changed zoning ordinance requirements. We did a lot of stuff in order to mitigate that impact. That was a long-winded uh, answer. I, I hope I touched on maybe a few of things here. Uh, thank you. Ed Owens, National Diversity Solutions, a Lexington-based MBE. If I might very quickly, a, a comment for Steve and then a question for Deborah. Steve, I, I thank you for your company living out everything that you spoke about here today. Uh, in Lexington, your company worked with my company to award us a $3 million contract so that we could provide door frame and hardware for you on the uh, University of Kentucky uh, dormitory project. So uh, your company, your brother, who happens to be CEO of the company, lives it. <clears throat> and Deborah, my, my question to you is, we, we've heard in an earlier session how the Charlotte Airport punches well above its weight in terms of the size of community. Um, most communities with that are growing that have the type of airport that you have really try to figure out a way to bring their light rail system to their airport. Can you give some insight into the decision-making process and the, the leadership points that made Charlotte decide that you would not take your light rail to the airport? Well, first and foremost, we haven't necessarily made that, that decision. <laughs> okay. uh, the second thing is, when we were thinking about the function of our, of our airport, our airport currently, um, and I would say when we were making decisions and recommendations about transit, which was in the early 2000s, um, our airport functioned more as a commuter airport. Uh, uh, transfers. You come in, I just heard Jennifer say, um, I have been to your airport a number of times, but I, this is about the first or second time that I've been to your city. And that's what was happening. We were not getting people literally having Charlotte as the destination. And so the challenge of do we go through the expense of at least creating light rail, it's still identified though as a uh, as a potential streetcar line to expand uh, for the, the west border is uh, how we uh, define it. Uh, right now we have what we call an enhanced bus called a sprinter that is providing service currently. Um, I will suggest to you also that one of the biggest challenges uh, related to uh, strategic light rail planning is, is funding. We, we just um, are, are having a, a difficult time getting funding uh, to expand our system. We have quarters, but we don't have a transit system yet, and, and that's our biggest challenge. Again, let me reinforce that um, a rapid transit, and maybe this won't be rapid, streetcar may not be rapid, but a, a, a transit option, a rail option, is still under study and, and, and discussion for the airport. Thank you. Uh, we'll have time just for one more question, but I hope they will stay a little bit afterwards to answer the other questions that we didn't have time to get to. So. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Sandy Cannon. Um, I serve on the Board of Health in Lexington. Thank you very much for being here today. We are, as a community, focused on three livability issues, unemployment, obesity, and safe neighborhoods. All three of you have st strong um, just actions that, that bear on all three of those. I did not hear anything about bicycling, so I'm very curious about that. I'm curious as, as uh, the very broad and diverse population that's living here, how um, issues of wellness are being um, taken in, into account with the, the city planning and the, the combination of the transportation and jobs and all of that, and certainly the urban, urban and work environments downtown all wrapped together. So from a public health perspective, how is what each of you are doing impacting those things which can save us 
billions of dollars. Thank you. I'll speak to that from a limited perspective as a developer. I mean, I, I think an urban lifestyle is a much more healthy lifestyle. It would be when you, when you see a graph of obesity versus urban centers of America, it's pretty major. Uh, I, I live downtown, I work downtown, and I find, you know, several years ago I just quit to drive because I just walk everywhere and I just think it's a healthy way, it's a healthy lifestyle. But we do have a bike share program in town, started a couple years ago, it's been very successful, um, where you can just uh, have a membership, it's like a car, you can bike, you can be in South End, I do it all the time. We have developed, we're developing a new project in South End, we're focusing on trying to enhance that. I live, I work in an office building where I have an office on the second floor and have to take the elevator to get to the street. <laughs> it really bothers me. It's a, this building we're developing has a, it's a, has a main major stair and to encourage people to take their stair when they're standing there waiting for their elevator. No matter what, it's only a five-story building, but you can walk that easily all the time. But that's an extra stair in the building just to try to encourage people to walk it. Uh, we're also having bike share. This is a mixed-use retail and office building. We're going to have bike share in our building. It's on it's between two link stops. So the idea is to encourage people to take transit. If you have to go to a meeting during the day, you can check out a bike. We're also going to have an electric car that's plugged into the garage. You can check out as well. To encourage just walking, taking bikes, and leaving cars. It's a big challenge in any community our size or your size. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's a lifestyle that once you start uh, immersing yourself in, it's very compelling. Uh, we're doing the same thing from a regulatory perspective as well. Um, a lot of um, what we uh, talk about in terms of our urban street design guidelines talk about uh, the sizes of blocks, uh, which we have reduced significantly uh, with a little bit of opposition from some developers. Uh, but, but we've been able to accomplish that. Uh, we also saw on the screen where, when I talked about the features of a community that we want to be related to centers, quarters, and wedges, the number one thing that showed up was walking. Uh, so we think that certainly that uh, promotes uh, a healthy lifestyle. Uh, again, a lot of our uh, development Regulations related to zoning, encouraging more of a mixture of different type uses, a mixture of different type housing, um, so that we can, again, encourage uh, not just a design of a development where it is walkable, but to have things to walk to. And um, so I think that all of those things contribute to, um, to building healthy places. And I would say that we need to do a whole lot more, but certainly it's uh, front of mind, whereas I would say 20 to 30 years ago, it was back of mind. We just didn't even think it. In the, 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 the TOD uh, ordinances that they were talking about, there's actually a maximum on parking so that you can park two minutes cars to encourage people to take, uh, take other forms of training. So for diversity and inclusion, everything I'm about, about jobs, creating jobs, we saw some of the numbers. But what I was talking to is our partner as the chamber. This year, our theme in the chamber is a healthier Charlotte. So we have two major healthcare systems in the Charlotte, and they're both focused on hypertension and obesity. Again, getting out and everybody thinking about it. And we're one of the most bikeable cities in the, in the country, if I remember right. We've got miles and miles of traffic. So everything we do is around that health. I know we're not the healthiest city that is in uh, Minneapolis. It is the healthiest city in the United States right now, but it's something that's constantly on all of our lines all the time. We just keep focusing for it. Thank you very much. And we've got a gift. We have a premium gift for you from the Bluegrass State that I'm going to give you, and then Ken's going to wrap this up for this session. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you to all, all of our speakers. Thank you for your time today. We have a strong lineup of programs.